from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening. I'm uh, Frost Gifford, the Director of Scholarly Programs here at the Library, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here this evening to hear Harold Bloom. Let me explain a little bit the genesis of this event and why it's called Shakespeare and Genius. Last year when Harold Bloom published Genius, uh, he was to come to the library to discuss it, but unfortunately uh, intervening medical conditions, which are now, I'm glad to say, been fully rectified, intervened, and that occasion never took place. Harold Bloom is irrepressible, even when he's in the hospital, and he wrote this book, <laughs> Hamlet, Poem Unlimited, which has just been published uh, this month, March of this year. And it is to fill a lacuna in his own book, uh, Shakespeare book, Shakespeare, The Invention of the Human, which was published in 1998. So uh, I suggested a triptych. Why don't, we, why don't we put genius between the two meditations on Shakespeare? And that's how this, this came to be. Now, this isn't as unlikely as it sounds because genius, which is organized on the principles of the Kabbalah, begins with Cater, the crown. And the crown is the luster, the luster of the masters, each of whom dominates his genre forever. The first in the crown is Shakespeare, combined with Cervantes, Montaigne, Milton, and Tolstoy. And the essay on Shakespeare opens with that marvelous sonnet 129. I won't say more about genius, except I urge you to read it, because we're really here to discuss principally Hamlet. We're here to discuss why the author who created, in Harold Bloom's words, Rosalind, Falstaff, Hamlet, Iago, Lear, Macbeth, Cleopatra, figures we know better than ourselves, why does this genius make his longest and most complex play a play about playing, art holding up the mirror to art, self-referential and yet not self-revealing, a drama unlimited? And who is Harold Bloom? How does one describe a force of nature, a storm of intellectual energy, whose commentaries are, in the words of Mike Abrams of Cornell, like reading classical authors by flashes of lightning. Fortunately, I found the apt description, where else, if you're seeking to describe a storm, where else to go but at the Tempest? And in uh, Harold Bloom's discussion of the Tempest, he comments on Prospero's final word, not final words, but Prospero's promise of auspicious gales. And we are blown pleasantly away by the powerful magic of the critic's art. You know the facts. Sterling Professor of Humanities at Yale, Berg Professor of English at NYU, former Charles Elliott Norton Professor at Harvard, author of 26 or 27, those are his counts, books, a MacArthur Prize Fellow, a member of the Academy of Arts and Letters, recipient of its Gold Medal for Belles Lettres, and the International Prize of Catalonia. But facts do not a human make. And we have with us one who believes passionately in human character and who will tell us how Shakespeare, above all in his longest play, invents the human, Harold Bloom. Thank you. Uh, this is a more or less uh, formal lecture, not drawn from uh, either of the three books. Prosser was kind enough to mention. Um, hmm, the microphone sounds rather odd. Um, it's called uh, Coda, Reading and Reflection, or The Genius of Hamlet. We read to reflect and to be reflected. Many, if not most of us, can see something of the self reflected in the mirror 
that Shakespeare supposedly holds up to nature. Oscar Wilde rightly rejected that notion, wittily asserting that it only improved Hamlet's madness as a critic. As Wilde knew well, Hamlet is only mad north, northwest. The wind that blows upon him is mostly from the south. Having written a rather long book on genius, followed by quite a short one on Hamlet, I intend here to work through some of the relations between reading and reflection by invoking the genius of Hamlet, meaning both prince and play. I mean reflection in my hero, Dr. Samuel Johnson's double sense of the word. A mirror is held up to nature, <clears throat> then the image in the mirror returns us to the mind's meditation upon itself in relation to that image. Johnson gives us a paradigm for self-consciousness, for critical thinking about the thinking that takes place in a play, poem, novel, or story. Genius for Johnson manifests itself by invention, and the test for authentic genius becomes the power of original invention. Johnson praised the tragedy of Hamlet for what he called its variety. But otherwise, he did not single it out for its uniqueness. <coughs> Something about it, I surmise, made the great critic uneasy. Unlike so many among us, he did not fall in love with Prince Hamlet. The tragedy of the Prince of Denmark did not assume its centrality in Shakespeare's work until the age of Romanticism, first in Britain, then in Germany, belatedly, as always, in France. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not a great admirer of what has been coming out of intellectual Paris for about three generations now. In fact, after Paul Valéry, it's been all downhill may indeed be what some of our recent difficulties with that nation have been about. But never mind, that's not what this lecture is on. And I promised myself not to drive us all mad since now in old age I begin to be intolerably digressive, so I, I won't do that again, I hope. <laughs> to a remarkable degree, the romantic image of Hamlet in the graveyard contemplating the skull of Yorick, the jester, and I think in a sense Hamlet's true father and mother, of Hamlet in the graveyard contemplating the skull of Yorick fostered the revival of the cult of genius <coughs> in the later 18th century. When the critic William Hazlitt remarked, it is we who are Hamlet, he completed a movement of sensibility that already had centered upon Shakespeare's most enigmatic protagonist. The Hazlittian contention that Hamlet is every man is dialectical since the black prince's enormous consciousness, much the widest in all of literature, also makes him the antithesis of every man. Just as Don Quixote is at once universal and extraordinarily idiosyncratic. If Dr. Johnson granted to Hamlet's play the praise of variety, August von Schlegel in 1809 first noted that Hamlet has no firm belief either in himself or in anything else, which is, I think, of course, true. Even Coleridge was mystified by the play, which is of no genre whatsoever, and which breaks all the fundamental rules of stage representation. Indeed, I think, after four centuries, it's still the most experimental play uh, ever written. We ought to give Victor Hugo the credit for first saying how unbounded the play is. The general judgment for a long time has been that Victor Hugo's book on Shakespeare is primarily about Victor Hugo, but let us recall Oscar Wilde's observation that criticism is the only civilized form of autobiography. <laughs> How accurate Hugo is when he writes of, and I translate him here, Hamlet, the appalling the unaccountable, complete in incompleteness, all in order to be nothing. Swinburne went beyond Hugo, whom he greatly admired, 
in his study of Shakespeare by finding in Prince Hamlet, quite accurately, and this is a quotation from Swinburne, the strong conflux of contending forces. For once, Sigmund Freud regressed, I think made a terrible mistake, by finding, actually by attempting to fasten the Oedipus complex upon Hamlet, it will not stick and merely shows that Freud did better than T.S. Eliot, who preferred Coriolanus to Hamlet, or so he said. Who can believe Eliot when he exposes his own Hamlet complex by declaring the play to be, of all things, an aesthetic failure? Which, of course, always makes me wonder here, I'd be digressing again, if Hamlet is an aesthetic failure, then the world, east, west, north, or south, has never seen an aesthetic success. James Joyce did far better than Eliot in the library scene of Ulysses, where Stephen marvelously credits Shakespeare in this play with universal fatherhood, while accurately implying that Hamlet is fatherless, thus opening a pragmatic gap between Shakespeare and Hamlet. Hamlet, I would agree, is unfathered because his play is of no genre and as a drama rebels finally against Shakespeare himself. Doubtless Shakespeare invested much of his pride and his affection in Hamlet, but the prince is ungrateful clearly resents the play he dominates and has no particular affection for Shakespeare. Though we see Hamlet attired in the black of mourning, I think it is wholly questionable whether his grief is ever for his father or whether his jealousy has that much to do with his sexual magnets of a mother. The play's subject massively is neither mourning for the dead nor revenge upon the living. All that matters is Hamlet's consciousness of his own consciousness, infinite, unlimited, and at war with itself. Something crucial in Hamlet has died well before the play opens. Foregrounding the play and its protagonist will take us back to the only vital relationship that Hamlet ever has had or could have with Yorick, King Hamlet's jester, who died, the gravedigger tells us, when the prince was seven. The grief the child then felt we can only surmise, but what I think must be finally the play's most important scene, Hamlet's battle of wits with the formidable gravedigger, allows such surmise most of the material poetica that it requires. The enormous subject of this play is the meaning of self-consciousness and the transcendence of play acting that produces the Hamlet of Act V, whose consciousness is so drastically purged of self. More even than King Lear, Hamlet's play turns into a cosmological drama, which is what the prince demands and requires, but which Shakespeare is rather reluctant to grant him. Hamlet is not, of course, the only Shakespearean character who dwarfs his role in the play. Shylock, Falstaff, Malvolio, Iago, and Cleopatra all are, as it were, hobgoblins who have run off with the garland of Apollo. Though I continue to love Falstaff best, I acknowledge with some melancholy that even Falstaff is not quite as transcendent as Hamlet is. But then I cheer up when I remember that Falstaff is immanence, that is to say with an A-I-M-M-A-N-E-N-C, immanence itself, pure being. Moved into the same drama, Falstaff would have tried to replace Hal with Hamlet, but to little avail. In the combat of wit, Falstaff would hold his own, but I think there is no love left in Hamlet once Yorick is dead. Both old formalists and new resenters are very glad to run me out of the academy, though I still won't budge, for judging Hamlet and Falstaff to be more real than they are. <laughs> but I intend a precise distinction by that. None of us in this room is how meaning gets started rather than repeated. Hamlet and Falstaff are very rare instances <laughs> 
of how fresh meaning does get started through excess, overflow, and what Wallace Steeman charmingly called floor abundance. Stated more bluntly, Hamlet and Falstaff are geniuses. By genius, I name what I have surveyed recently in rather too large a book, Genius, a Mosaic of 100 Exemplary Creative Minds, a book about which I have sad feelings because, as Prosse intimated, it's rather like an abandoned child since they uh, sliced into me on the very day of its publication. A literary genius is tested by her or his ability to expand our consciousness without deforming it. I guess I'll repeat that because it seems central to me. The test for literary genius is her or his ability to expand the reader's consciousness without in any way deforming it. Falstaff's genius is in the oral tradition. He is the ribald Socrates of East Cheap. Hamlet's genius is yet more unique. He is the only literary dramatic character who can be said to possess and manifest an authorial consciousness all his own, not to be confused with William Shakespeare's. Perhaps all that Hamlet truly has in common with Shakespeare is that their mutually scandalous intellectual brilliance is so enigmatic. Hamlet, character and play, has so many literary descendants from Goethe through Samuel Beckett that the choice of what came after always has a touch of the arbitrary. It is best, I think, to employ the most magnificent Milton Satan in Paradise Lost, a Shakespearean figure who may at first seem more clearly to come out of Iago and Macbeth than to be quarried from Hamlet. To Iago, Satan owes his starting point, what he calls the sense of injured merit of having been passed over, whether for Cassio or in his case for the Son of God. Macbeth certainly does set the pattern for Satan's trafficking with the abyss of the night world. A boy eight years old when Shakespeare died, Milton as a young man actually contemplated writing another Macbeth, but then wisely thought better of it. In The Satan of Paradise Lost, Milton, knowingly, I would think, portrayed a second Hamlet, a very dangerous enterprise even for the strongest poet in the English language after Shakespeare and Chaucer. In the tentative overtures of what he left behind is what we now call the Trinity Manuscript, Milton sketches a tragedy, not an epic, to be called Adam Unparadised, not Paradise Lost. At what is now the start of book four of the epic, Satan stands on Mount Nephetes and speaks his last greatness in the poem. Milton's nephew, who worked with him, and he always had to have someone to work with him after a certain date because he was stone blind. Well, his memory was astonishing. Milton's nephew, who worked with him, tells us that this speech would have begun Adam unparadised. Neil Forsyth in a very good book just published called The Satanic Epic, emphasizes Shakespeare's ambivalence towards Brutus and Julius Caesar as one influence upon Milton's ambivalence towards Satan. Forsyth rightly thinks that Shakespeare was similarly ambivalent towards Hamlet, but Brutus is, of course, a dwarf of disintegration when compared to the brilliance and charisma of the Prince of Denmark. If Paradise Lost from Satan's perspective is revenge tragedy, then the play of Hamlet cannot be, since inwardness is far deeper in the Prince of Denmark than it is in Satan. The non-genre of Poem Unlimited, actually invented as a category by poor Polonius, the non-genre of Poem Unlimited renders Hamlet an even more cosmological agonist than Satan ever can be. Hamlet is not a Satan. Damnation is not his fate. He is neither Lutheran nor Calvinist nor Catholic for that matter, even though he attends, we are asked to believe, the Lutheran University of Wittenberg. His infinite inwardness is more radical than is the Augustinian self 
as preached by Luther and by Calvin. Satan's wounded consciousness is more Hamletian than Protestant, and Hamlet is just as much his own theologian as he is his own psychologist. Satan's soliloquies would not be possible without Hamlet's innovation in his seven soliloquies. And yet Milton uneasily pulls back from the paradigm. We are never given the crucial moment of transition when Lucifer, the morning star, fades into Satan. Hamlet, far more radically self-reliant than Luther or Calvin, transcends Augustinianism and leaps past even his great romantic inheritors, Goethe and Demerson, Nietzsche and Kierkegaard. The genius of Hamlet, I think, gets away from Shakespeare, as even Falstaff could not. Complete genius may well be beyond representation, but unless Hamlet himself incarnates it, there can be no play. One can doubt that Shakespeare intended the prince, Hamlet, to be unbound, and yet Hamlet breaks loose. The prince does not want to be the protagonist of a revenge tragedy. He wants and needs to be in the cosmological openness of the drama King Lear or the play Macbeth, rather than the rotten miasma of Claudius's Elsinore. Shakespeare will not grant Hamlet what he desires, and yet cannot control this most temperamentally capricious and preternaturally intelligent of all his creations. Satan is not Milton's own genius, though he would like to be. And Hamlet similarly is not Shakespeare's genius. I cannot say whether Hamlet would wish such an identity or not. Shakespeare is in Hamlet's drama as the two parts he acted, the father's ghost and probably doubling as the player king or first player. In my short book, Hamlet, Poem Unlimited, I propose that a kind of civil war goes on in the text between Hamlet and his maker. Milton notoriously editorializes against his Satan, which is, alas, a real blot upon Paradise Lost, though the poem is so powerful it could sustain more blots than that. Shakespeare, perhaps dazzled by what he has wrought, but this can only be surmised, reacts to Hamlet's aggressivity by smashing the mimetic covenant in this most experimental of all plays ever. From act two, scene two, when you will remember the players enter, through act three, scene two, when Claudius breaks up the rewriting by Hamlet of the murder of Gonzago into the mousetrap by running out screaming for lights, lights. From act two, scene two, through act three, scene two, which is a thousand lines out of the 4,000 lines of the play, there is no play but only a whirling dance of plays within plays, theatrical gossip, admonitions to the players, and the blandishments of non-existent plays, including the untitled one on the death of Priam and the weird play in progress, The Murder of Gonzago, which Hamlet revives into his own mousetrap and outrageous skit. Hamlet's revenge is upon Shakespeare, and I think Shakespeare buoyantly accepts the threat. Prince and play botcher, which is what they called the play doctor in those days, conduct a familial quarrel, intimate and perhaps not wholly accessible to us, though I think more accessible than criticism has made out. I am aware how very odd all this sounds, but Hamlet the play is nothing but paradox. We rarely know when Hamlet is not acting out a part he has devised for himself. If your intellect is limitless, how can you possibly know when you are being sincere? In addition to all his other bewildering aspects, Hamlet knowingly is his own best audience. He is dramatist, player, and auditor. Shakespeare is only the first two and reasserts his dominance as author, director, stage designer in Act Five, when Hamlet, after a sea change, quite literally a sea change, matures as Death's ambassador to us. When Hamlet emerges as almost totally disinterested, or perhaps one should say nihilistic, Shakespeare resurrects as master in what I think uneasily again becomes his domain. Hamlet and Don Quixote, play and novel, both carry Western representation to limits 
not since surpassed. And no literary works that I know of themselves violates their own limits as these two persist in doing. Don Quixote and Sancho Panza in part two of their saga are highly aware of being characters in part one and also a feeling slandered by the rival part two actually written by an anonymous imposter to this day, who I think he's a rather talented writer. We don't know who that was. Hamlet does not experience freedom until he can separate his extraordinary self-consciousness, indeed his status as the Western hero of consciousness, from his own enormous passion for theatricality. Theatricalism and inwardness break from one another as Hamlet stands in the snow in Act 4, Scene 4, and watches the army of Fortinbras march off to an absurd battle for a plot of ground not large enough to bury all who will die disputing it. Of Shakespeare's own inwardness, we know absolutely nothing. Even in the sonnets, he is very careful to detach himself from what to be, what ought to be, his own sufferings and humiliations, though he will not treat them as such. Of Hamlet's inward self, I think we know as much as we are capable of absorbing. Sigmund Freud once said, and it's one of his most astonishing remarks, I mean that in a very favorable sense, if one is to speak of the genius of Freud, this would be certainly one instance. Freud said that all thinking, all thinking, needs to be emancipated from its sexual past. Obsessive thinking on that account is what cannot be freed. Though Milton Satan takes Hamlet for precursor, Hamlet is not an obsessive thinker as Satan is. It may be that had Milton been willing to foreground Satan for us as the unfallen Lucifer, we would understand better the satanic predicament. Shakespeare is the greatest master of what I would call foregrounding or as we always might say, inference in Western literature. Hamlet is given a long foreground, as are Falstaff and Cleopatra, but Falstaff is more solitary. I mean, Freudian slip. Something in me must want to be talking about Falstaff. <laughs> what is it written on the page and what I intended is, but Hamlet's is more solitary and astonishingly divided against itself, forgive me. Like Shakespeare, Hamlet seems informed by Montaigne. One might indeed expect Hamlet to write essays in Montaigne's mode instead of being an amateur dramatist, but Hamlet's genius is that of an improviser. Since Shakespeare was the most notorious of improvisers ever, as Ben Jonson keeps telling us, this is one instance at least where Shakespeare risks some degree of self-portraiture. Surely, like Shakespeare, Hamlet is copious and rapid in thought and in speech. Unlike Shakespeare, Hamlet is altogether too interested in death, which returns me to his foreground. The central argument of my little book, Hamlet Poem Unlimited, is that we need to discard the common notion that the play is about Prince Hamlet's mourning for his dead father or his outrage at his mother's wonderfully lively sexuality. He may speak at times as though the double shock of his father's sudden death and of his mother's remarriage has inaugurated a radical change in him, but foregrounding allows us to infer that something central in Hamlet has died before the play opens. The authentic originality of Shakespeare's play, its inventive genius, is that its prime subject is Hamlet's consciousness of his own consciousness, unlimited yet, as I've said, at war with itself. It makes sense to me to say that my closest friends and I are self-conscious. Ah, thank you, Professor dear. But I find it, uh, thank you, dear, but I find it, old friend, very kind of you, but I find it misleading, thank you, dear, to say that that of Hamlet because his consciousness, unlike ours, always intends an object. T.S. Eliot, in his unfortunate essay on Hamlet, 
allowed himself to sneer, and I quote this gratuitous and nasty sentence, we should be thankful that Walter Pater did not fix his attention on this play. I myself have never found a better essay on measure for measure than Walter Pater's, and I wish that the marvelous aesthetic critic had left us something on Hamlet. Eliot, like his abhorred Freud, as I've said, had a Hamlet complex, and so decided that, and I quote Eliot, the essential emotion of the play is the feeling of a son towards a guilty mother. Pater would not have made so feeble an interpretation, and I'm happy to quote here his contrast between Measure for Measure and Hamlet. This is Pater, so I wish it were Bloom. Measure for Measure is hardly less indicative than Hamlet even of Shakespeare's reason, of his power of moral interpretation. It deals not like Hamlet with the problems that beset one of exceptional temperament, but with mere human nature. We, Walter Pater included, are mere human nature. Hamlet's temperament is certainly exceptional since its power of negation is so overwhelming. Pater, forgive me, who believed, I got ice in my mouth. I'm sorry, my dears. Medication, as you know, uh, makes the throat extremely dry, so bear, bear with me. Uh, Pedro, who believed only in perception and sensation, was very close to Hamlet's skepticism and to Montaigne's. Eliot, Christian, long before he converted to the Church of England, was so offended by Hamlet that he actually described the Prince of Denmark as an adolescent. I have loathed Eliot's criticism my whole long life but sympathize with him because his fear of Hamlet is accurate. Hamlet is more intelligent than we are, and as he warns us, very dangerous to know. The Hamlet complex is a great burden. Oedipus is victimized by dramatic irony, but not Hamlet, who knows more than we do. His psychological acuity remains devastating. And together with Falstaff, Hamlet pragmatically is Shakespeare's implicit celebration of his own genius of his final emancipation from the influence of Christopher Marlowe. To phrase this differently, Hamlet's influence upon Shakespeare himself made everything possible in the plays to come. Shakespeare lavished all his intelligence upon Hamlet and received as recompense the realization that his own capacity for representation was unlimited. After Hamlet, inwardness could go no further except into the madness of solipsism. Hamlet taught Shakespeare what he also teaches us, which is that consciousness indeed defines genius. Like Hamlet, Shakespeare manifestly exceeds us in consciousness. And where consciousness is unlimited, it grows impatient with mimesis or the imitation of nature. If we had adequate productions and performances of Hamlet, I myself have never seen one, though people tell me, I was up in Boston, and many people who came forward to talk to me afterwards said that uh, one simply must survive long enough to see Mr. Simon Russell Beale in the role, but alas, yeah. I, I haven't as yet. Um, we might understand better that the play transcends the imitation of an action and finds ways of representing thinking as such, thus inducting us into the possibilities of what could be called a theater of mind. Whether Ibsen and Chekhov, Pirandello and Beckett, all of whom wrote their own Hamlets, whether they have been adequate to the challenge of Hamlet remains uncertain. You can make of the play Hamlet and of the protagonist pretty much what you will. Whether you are playgoer or reader, critic or director, actor or ideologue, push any stance or quest into it and the drama will illuminate what you have brought with you, even if the work itself remains in darkness. The most accomplished actor I have attended in it was John Gielgud, scores and scores of years ago. And I remember mostly how beautifully he articulated the, he articulated the hero's tremendous linguistic range while slighting, and perhaps this was the director's fault, the equally remarkable intelligence 
I have not given up all hope that a grand presentation of Hamlet will come along in my lifetime, and as I say, people have been assuring me that it has, but I haven't had the good fortune to see it. The grandeur of King Lear seems to me totally unplayable in our cultural climate, yet Hamlet does seem less unattainable. That may be because almost all of us seem to have an intimate relationship, if not with the actual play or the prince, yet with our own idea of both, however unformed or mistaken that idea may turn out to be. We need genius in whatever form we can get it. And the play Hamlet frequently is what first comes to mind when we go out searching to fulfill that particular need. What is it that makes Hamlet the most central and universal of all Shakespeare's plays? I can get some help from A.C. Bradley's conclusion. And I quote Bradley, who was after all a very fine critic of Shakespearean tragedy. He wrote, it was not that Hamlet is Shakespeare's greatest tragedy or most perfect work of art. It was that Hamlet most brings home to us at once the sense of the soul's infinity and the sense of the doom which not only circumscribes that infinity, but appears to be its offspring. That, I think, is poignant on Bradley's part, but perhaps a touch diffuse. I turn to what is still my favorite 20th century critic of Shakespeare, Harold Goddard, who wrote, if a Falstaffian Howe could have taught England to play in the common acceptation of the term, Hamlet could have taught Denmark to play in a deeper creative sense. I am always moved by Goddard's romantic idealism, but I'm also aware that this neglects the dangerous element in Hamlet, it quite simply makes him a killer and a killer without remorse. So I turn instead to Anne Barton, an admirably reliable critic who wrote, only in Shakespeare's Hamlet does the audience retain sympathy for the hero from beginning to end. Pragmatically, she is accurate. But I wonder how else we could hope to respond since Hamlet speaks almost 40% of the lines in the play <laughs> and is always the concern of everyone even when he is off stage. He is antithetical to every man and to every woman since his charisma puts him beyond us, and yet he is a figure of dream and desire for many, if not most, among us. I will attempt my own summing up of our relation to Hamlet to conclude this. <laughs> I noted when I read some version of this uh, in Cambridge, you know, Boston, Cambridge, uh, the other evening and kept saying, look, I'm going to conclude it now. That it did begin to remind me of one of my favorite works by one of my favorite composer, Johannes Brahms' first symphony, which ends magnificently seven or eight times before it actually does end. <laughs> and I always get confused in listening to it. Angus Fletcher is still my favorite critic in my own generation, asks us to conjecture with him on the difficult subject of thinking in literature. For Fletcher, representing thought in literary language involves what he calls an iconography of thinking, and not one more wearisome theory of textuality or of linguistic adequacy. Refreshingly, <coughs> Fletcher reminds us, and I quote from him here, that great works of literature require style and intelligence which belong to an author. Uh, if Angus were here, I would hug him for that. Uh, the death of the author, of course, never took place, except in Paris and in its weak imitators on this side of the water. Here is Fletcher on Shakespeare's mastery of figurative language. To the extent that Shakespeare speaks with streams and cataracts of poetic figures, the assumption seems to arise that thought is whatever sorry, my dear, it's ice again, forgive me, is whatever can be put into language somehow, and he italicizes that somehow. So I come back to myself now, rather than to my dear old friend Angus. No one else in Shakespeare, as I think we would all say, speaks with streams and cataracts of poetic figures more strikingly than Hamlet does. And there does not appear to be anything whatsoever that Hamlet cannot put into language. And yet what is strangest in Hamlet the play, 
and so in Shakespeare are the implicit and unanswered questions that remain superbly elliptical. Why does Hamlet return to Elsinore after the aborted sea voyage to England? Why does Shakespeare insouciantly risk the dramatic continuity of his play by cutting so extraordinary a gap from Act 2, Scene 2, as I said, through Act 3, 2? Why does he provide for the formidable Hamlet so mere an opponent as Claudius? Hardly the mighty opposite, the Prince of Denmark requires and wants? The answer is that Shakespeare, after all, grudgingly does give Hamlet the cosmological drama that the protagonist demands of him. The play is sublimely large in its hero's spirit, and the ellipses testify to the eminence of the work. Of Hamlet himself, I think we must finally observe that his deepest desire is to come to an end of play acting and to seek annihilation as the only way out of his labyrinth of inwardness. The enigma of Hamlet, and I mean the prince, not the play, is that so many of us are moved to identify with him when he does not want or need such identification. And yet he urges Horatio to stay alive to retell the play's story, lest the prince bear a wounded name forever. Why does Hamlet still care? Why, after all, do any of us care whether our name will be remembered and how? Hamlet, who questions everything, perhaps reminds us of the enormous cost were any of us to join him in his project. Thank you. Um, thank you. I, I am willing, uh, within the limits of reason, and hoping that no ideologue will suddenly rise uh, to entertain a few questions. Yes, dear. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.